Good morning. Welcome y'all here on this wet day, but it is a good day to be in the Lord's house. Amen? Before I go into this sermon, I want us to take time and pray together and dedicate this part of the worship service to the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, first of all, we just want to praise you for who you are. You are the living God, the true God. There is none like unto you. No one, no thing can compare to you. You are holy, you are loving, you are perfect in every way. And right now, Lord, just collectively, we give you praise. You deserve it. Father, we want to thank you for what you have done for us. You have given us Christ. And in Christ, we have everything we need. In Christ, we have salvation. In Christ, we have a relationship with you. In Christ, we have hope of eternal life. And in Christ, we have the strength to face whatever trial, whatever storm may come our way. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Father, this morning, as we think about serving you, as we think about serving your kingdom, I pray that even now your Holy Spirit would move and would convict, starting with me, that we would serve you more, that we would do more, that we would be more committed slaves to your son Jesus. Father, as I get ready to proclaim this message, I know that I am inadequate, Father. I know that I have so many weaknesses and limitations, and I know that if I get up here by myself, it's going to be a miserable failure. Well, Father, I also know that you have called me. I know that you have filled me with your Holy Spirit because of salvation, because of Jesus. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint me in a special way, would give me utterance, would give me strength, Lord, to proclaim this your word. Father, I pray that as we hear, that you would open us up to hear it, that you would make us sensitive, Lord, convict us, comfort us, encourage us, do whatever is necessary, Lord, to get our attention. Most of all, Father, speak to us. We need a word from you. Now, I ask this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Folks today are worried. Did you know that? I have been in the ministry now for 11 years, and I have never seen a time in my 11 years when people were so worried, so disturbed, so concerned about things. Everybody I talked to this week, people that would come by my office, people that would call somewhere along the conversation we would start to talk about things going on in this nation, problems confronting this country, things that are coming up in the future, and people would address, would express their worries. Do you feel that way now? A lot of things going on, a lot of things to be worried about. This week I was reading in Time magazine, and they conducted a poll, and they asked Americans, asked the citizens, what are you worried about? What disturbs you? What concerns you in your personal life and the life of this country right now? And they got the results back from these statistics and they gave five different categories of worriers. Listen to these different, these different types of worriers. The first one they call the stressed providers. And this was about 21% of the people that they asked and said that this segment worries about personal and family finances. They worry about employment for themselves, employment for family members. They're stressed providers. Maybe that's you this morning. The second category were the worry warts. And notice how that's spelled. That tells you about the meaning. These are the folks, it's about 16%, they worry about wars, the threats of war. For instance, like what's going on with Iran. They worry about the ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're worried about the threats of terrorism. They're worried about natural disasters. They're worried about other types of hardships. The worry warts. Then you have the minute men. This is 20%. This segment worries about illegal immigration. They're worried about crime rising and all that that brings with it. Then you have the social conscience worrier. This is 25% of those that they asked. In this segment, they worry about global warming. They worry about the ecosystem, about pollution, hunger, health care, wellness, human rights, civil rights, worker rights. They're worried about the social issues facing our country today. 
And then you have the politically and economically disturbed. It's about 18%. And this segment worries about the upcoming election. They worry about political candidates. They worry about different issues and events confronting our nation. Business and broad economic issues. Ethical, moral issues confronting our nation. These are the things that we are worried about right now. And if you're like me, if we're honest, I've got several of these on my mind at any given time. We're concerned about the future. We're concerned about our families. We are concerned about our country. People are worrying. How do we as Christians, you and I as individual believers, and how do we as a church address this problem? God has put believers in this country for a time such as this. God has put this church here at a time such as this. What do we do? How do we respond? Well, let me start by telling you how we don't respond. We don't respond by joining in the chorus of these warriors. We know that our God is sovereign. We know that our God is in control. We know how the story ends. We know He's going to take care of everything. So we should not join in. The worrying. So what should we do? We shouldn't worry. We should work. Y'all hear me? I'm going to say that again. We shouldn't join in the worrying. We shouldn't take part in the anxiety, the panic, the worry that's going on right now. We should be working for the Lord right now. Because this is a unique opportunity for us. People are disturbed. People are getting out of their comfort zone, their little selfish sphere that they live in. It's being rocked. And now they're starting to think about other things. They're starting to think about the deeper things of life. Their comfort, their peace is being shaken. This is the time for us to engage those people with the gospel. This is the time for us to go with the saving message of Jesus. But... For us to do that, for us to engage the lost in this nation, for us to dialogue with those warriors and present them the peace that only Jesus gives, that means you and I have to work. That means that you and I have to take on the responsibility that God has given us to serve Him. Take it on and do it. So today I want to talk to you about working for the kingdom. The title of this message is Encouraging Kingdom Work. And we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God and we're going to be talking about what we need to be doing. If you brought your Bible this morning, I'm going to ask that you would open it to the Gospel of Mark. And we are still in chapter 4. So be turning to Mark chapter 4. If I could give a title to Mark chapter 4, it would be the parable chapter. I didn't realize it until I started going through here. There are a bunch of parables in Mark chapter 4. There's five of them. We've covered three so far, and we're going to look at two this morning and finish up the parables in that chapter. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Today we would call it an illustration. Jesus used these parables, used this way of teaching throughout His ministry to convey spiritual truth, to convey something deeper and higher than a simple earthly meaning. And the two parables that we are going to see this morning have to do with the kingdom of God. With each parable, he says, the kingdom of God is like... And then he gives the parable. He is describing what the kingdom of God is like. Now, before we read these parables, we need to have one thing clear. What does Jesus mean when he speaks of the kingdom of God? What's he talking about there? When we read in the Gospels, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, what is he talking about? Well, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, simply put, is God's rule or reign. His sphere of influence. And when we talk about the kingdom, there's two aspects of it. There is an already aspect, and then there's a not yet aspect. Let me give you the already aspect. Jesus said in Luke, I believe it is, that the kingdom of God is within you. That is talking about when someone comes and they bow the knee to Jesus, they accept Him as Lord and as Savior, He comes to rule and to reign in their lives. And what did we say the kingdom was? Wherever God rules and reigns. Therefore, the kingdom is within them. There's that already aspect. When you share the gospel, when you spread the good news and someone receives Christ, there's the kingdom 
in their lives. That's the already aspect. But then you have the not yet. There is going to come a point in time when Jesus is going to come back. And then he is going to establish a literal earthly kingdom. These two parables that we're going to study this morning that we're going to be reading about deal with that already aspect. They deal with the spread of the gospel right here, right now. All right, let's look at these two parables now this morning. We're going to be looking first at the parable of the seed and then the parable of the mustard seed. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 26, God's Word says this, <coughs> And he, that being Jesus, was saying, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And as he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows, how? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But, the crop, but when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. There's the parable of the seed. Now the parable of the mustard seed. And he, that being Jesus again, said, How shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil... Though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word. These two parables concern the kingdom, concern the spreading of the gospel right here, right now. And with an eye to encourage all of us, to encourage all the believers who are listening, we're going to be thinking about the kingdom with a particular view of thinking about the kingdom work. So with that in mind, I want to share with you this morning some things about the kingdom of God that we need to understand right here, right now, so that we'll serve Him. The first thing that I want to share with you from this passage of God's Word, talking about the kingdom, is the summons to kingdom work. The summons to kingdom work. I told you earlier that I have been in the ministry for 11 years, and i tell you something that I have learned. If I've learned nothing else, I've learned this. God does not need me. God does not need us. He doesn't need our counsel, certainly doesn't need our advice. He doesn't need us. He could do it all by Himself if He chose to. If He desired to, He could accomplish it all by Himself. But you know and I know... God chooses not to work that way. He chooses to use us as His instruments. It is a great privilege to be able to serve Him. And we have to understand, we have to get it in our minds that He summons all of us to serve. He summons all of us to take on that responsibility, to take on the mantle of Christian service. I want to point this out to you. First, I want you to see as we think about this summons to kingdom work, I want you to see the mention of kingdom workers in these parables. First, look at verse 26 of our passage. Notice what Jesus is doing. Now, it may take me a long, way to, a long time to get there. You'll, you'll just follow along. Okay, I'm going somewhere. In verse 26, Jesus says, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. The idea in this parable of that man who casts seed upon the soil is a believer who goes out and shares the gospel, who witnesses for Christ Jesus. You all follow me? All right, now look at the second parable. Look at verse 31 of the parable of the mustard seed. Jesus says, It, or the kingdom of God, is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil. Now notice what he says there. It's like a mustard seed when sown upon the soil. That implies that somebody's there doing what? Sowing it. Again, that idea is a believer going forward into the world, sharing the good news, bearing a personal witness for Jesus. He mentions it in those two parables. In fact, he mentions it in all of the parables in Mark chapter 4. Let me just call your attention to it. Look in the parable of the sower and the seed. Mark 4. Verse 14, as he describes that parable, he said, The sower sows the word. Again, a believer who goes out and spreads the gospel. A believer who goes out and personally witnesses for Jesus. Then look at the next parable in that chapter. Look at the parable of the lamp there, verse 21. 
Listen to what he tells believers. A lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed. Is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? The idea is every believer has the light of Christ within them. They have the gospel and they are to take that light and shine it out into a dark and lost world. Again, the idea is what? Believers sharing the gospel, spreading the good news. Then look at the next parable. I call this one the parable of meat and measure. Look at verse 24. And Jesus was saying unto them, Take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. Jesus says, be careful with the truth you have, because you are responsible for using it. Again, he's emphasizing the exact same thing. Taking what you know to be true, taking that gospel message, and sharing it with the lost. What we see in all of these parables is what I call the mention of kingdom workers. Now, what does that mean? What is Jesus talking about here? What's the meaning for the kingdom workers here today? Jesus is mentioning it all these times to emphasize something, a very important point, and that is that every single believer is called to serve. I want you all to say that with me. If you get nothing else this morning, get this. Say it with me. Every single believer is called to serve. It does not matter your age. It does not matter your place or position in life. It does not matter your maturity in Christ, although some positions are for more mature believers than others. It does not matter if you are a Christian, if you have received Christ, if you have accepted the gospel message, then God has a position. God has a place of service for you. And we've got to do it. We must answer the summons. We must be about the business of serving Him. Think of it this way. We're going to get ready to vote here in November, aren't we? You're registered to vote. Now, it's a blessing to be able to vote, but what happens when you register to vote? Your name goes on a list of possible jury candidates, right? And from time to time, what happens? You get that summons in the mail. They want you to go and be part of a jury pool to possibly serve in the county or in the region on a jury Do you ball it up and throw it away and say, uh, I don't think so. I'm busy. I got things to do. You better not. Why? Because you could get a fine. If you keep not showing up, you could be held in contempt and they'll take you to jail. That's just a summons from an earthly judge. Jesus, the heavenly judge. Jesus, the heavenly ruler, summons all of his people, all of his followers, all of his believers to answer the call, to pick up that responsibility, to take on that mantle and serve. Have you answered the summons today? What are you doing for the Lord? Is there some ministry? Is there some mission? Is there something that you are involved in? There needs to be. Every believer has a duty. Every believer has a calling. Every believer has a place of service. And folks, the world needs it today. The world needs believers to step up and talk to them. Talk to the lost. Talk to those who are so worried, who are so concerned about the things of life and say, let me share with you some good news. Let me give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Let me tell you about Jesus. As we're thinking about the kingdom of God, we've saw, first of all, a summons to kingdom work. Now let me share with you something else. I want you to see the miracle of kingdom growth, the miracle of of kingdom growth. One of the things that keeps people from serving, it's affected me, and I know it has affected you. It has affected great men in the Bible. When God calls them to serve, you know what they say? I can't. I'm not qualified. I'm not able to. I just don't have the talents. I don't have the skills. I don't have the qualifications. God, you need to look for somebody else. Well, you know what? When they say that, They're absolutely right. Not about God looking for somebody else. But when they say, I can't, when they say, I'm not able, they're right. We're not able on our own to serve as we ought. We are not able on our own to do those things that God calls us to do and that God would have us to do. But that's where the Lord comes in. We don't serve on our own. The growth of the kingdom, the expansion of Christianity in the world, people receiving Christ, does not depend upon our skills, does not depend upon our talents. It depends upon God. 
And I call this the miracle of kingdom growth. God brings about the growth of His kingdom. Jesus illustrates this in the parable of the seed. Look at verses 26 and 29 again. <clears throat> this is an agricultural parable about a farmer. Listen to what he says. He says, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God to a farmer that goes out and sows the seed. He said that farmer, he goes out, he's prepared the field, he plants it, but then what does he do? He says he goes to sleep, he gets up, he goes about his daily business, and the seed comes up on its own. The spiritual truth here is that God brings the growth of His kingdom. We as believers, do you know what we are responsible for? We are responsible for sharing Christ. We are responsible for sharing the gospel. God is responsible for the results. He brings about the growth. And in this parable, as we're thinking about that miracle of kingdom growth, I want to point out two things to you. Two things that we see in this parable. First, we see man's passivity. Man's passivity. Again, look at verse 27. That farmer, he casts the seed upon the soil, but then what does he do? He goes to bed. He gets up. He continues on with his daily business of life. All the while, the seed is coming up. That describes us. We go out. We share the gospel. But who is really responsible for the results? God. Who is the one that convicts that person when we share Jesus? God. Who is the one that brings about that radical transformation that Jesus told Nicodemus was called being born again? Who does that? God. Our role is very passive in all of it. All we have to do is go out, share the gospel with others, and God... We'll take care of the rest. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. He's dealing with this divided church, and there's little cliques within the church, and each one of them are following these, these earthly leaders. And listen to what Paul said. He's trying to take the focus off of him and put it on God. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. All we did, that's what he's telling the church, all we did was plant the seed of the gospel. I planted it. Apollos came along. He taught you more. But who caused that growth? God caused the growth. Now let's step back and I want you to think for a moment. What does this mean for us? From a practical standpoint, the fact that in all this we are, we're passive to a degree. What does that mean for us? It gives us a freedom. Because the growth of the kingdom does not depend on us. Now, we have to go out and do the work. I've already told you what the work was and what God has called us to do. He's called us to share the gospel. He uses us in that way. But the growth does not hinge on our abilities, on our talents. The growth, people receiving Christ, depends upon God. And you know what that means? That means when we look at situations, <coughs> when we look at circumstances, we don't base the success, we don't base our possibility of success or failure on us. We base it on God. Think about it like this. The men in the church, you'll know especially what I'm talking about. You remember when you were a kid and you helped Daddy work on the car? Am I the only one here that did that? When you're a kid, you, there you go. You helped Daddy work on the car when you are a little boy. Did you really do that much help? But I didn't. My daddy said, you'll mess it up. You just stand there. <laughs> you just stand there and you hold the tools, right? You stand there. You got the crescent wrench. You got the socket wrench. If he needs another socket, you go back to the toolbox and you get it out and you bring it to him. Who's doing the actual work? Your dad is. He's actually taking care of business there. That's our involvement. The Lord uses us. He wants us to serve, but ultimately, who's doing the work? God. That means don't worry about feelings of inferiority. Don't think about what you can or cannot do because all things are possible with God. 
We see in this miracle of kingdom growth man's passivity, but notice something else. The Almighty's activity. The Almighty's activity. Look at verse 28 of that parable of the seed. Jesus, as He describes it, He says, "...the soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head." He's saying as the farmer goes and he plants, he doesn't really understand how it grows. He doesn't understand really how it comes up. The seed just kind of comes up of its own. And he's saying the kingdom of God is like that. What's he saying? That the kingdom grows by the activity, by the work of God. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We looked at verse 6, but I want you to see verse 7 now. He's writing to that church. He's telling them, don't you focus on those human leaders. You focus on God and what He does. He says, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God causes the growth. Again, this gives us this freedom. The Lord is active. The Lord is doing things. That means that you and I, we can go with an abandonment. We can go with a freedom. All we have to do is go and share Jesus. All we have to do is go and lift Him up and God will take care of the results. If we believe the gospel is true, if we believe the word is inspired, then it will speak for itself. It will do the work that it needs to do. All we have to do is lift it up. All we have to do is share it. And it will do what it needs to do. The miracle of kingdom growth. Throw out all those feelings of inferiority. Throw out all those feelings of I can't do this, I can't do that and focus on God and what He can do and what He will do. We've seen the summons to kingdom work. We've seen the miracle of kingdom growth. I'll share with you one more thing. I want you to see the extent of kingdom expansion. The extent of of kingdom expansion. I told you that one of the problems we face today as we try and share the gospel are our feelings of inferiority. Another problem that we face is we look around at how bad things are. We look around at how much opposition there is to the gospel. And if you're like me, sometimes you get pessimistic and you think, man, you never say this out loud, but you kind of think about it till you say, why try? Why bother? Things are so bad. The world is so immoral. Everyone is in such opposition, such rebellion to God. Why should I even try? Is the kingdom even growing? <clears throat> and that's when we need to come back to a truth, a very important truth that Jesus is going to show us here in a moment. God's method of working in this world is to start small, to start with the insignificant, and use it. Make it something big. Use it in a great way for His glory. Let me give you an example of this before I share with you the next parable. In 1857, we think that we're the only people who've been worried about the decline of Christianity, about immorality in our world. In 1857, churches in New York started to worry about a decline in church attendance, a rise in immorality in their city. I wonder what they would think now, right? But they were worried about it. And so one church, they got this guy, his name was Jeremiah Lamfer. He was a retired merchant. He had no theological training. He was not a pastor, not a preacher, anything like that. But some folks prayed and said, we think this guy can do something. So they asked him, we want you to help us reach this city. We want to reach this city for Christ. They contacted one man. You know what he did? The only thing that he could think of to do, the only way that he sensed God's leading was to just call for a prayer meeting at lunchtime on weekdays. He printed up a bunch of handbills advertising where it would be. He handed them out, and then he just waited. The first day, one other person came. The second day, two people came. Then it started to grow. They started to pray It spread from one room in the church to all of the rooms in the church, to the sanctuary of the church, to other churches throughout the city, and it got to the point where at the height of the layman's prayer revival of 1857, 50,000 people a day were coming to Christ. See what the Lord does? This is what's so awesome about His character. He'll take something small, 
something insignificant, one man calling for a little prayer meeting. And boom, bringing it into something big to expand his kingdom. That is the way that the Lord works. And Jesus speaks of that in that second parable, the parable of the mustard seed. Look at verses 30 to 32. He tells this last parable in Mark chapter 4 and he says, How shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall, or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. He uses a proverbial saying, a parable that was very common in his day. He says, God's kingdom is like a mustard seed. And at that time, the mustard seed was the smallest seed in that region of Israel. I was going to get a picture and put it up on the screens for you, but it was so small you couldn't see it. A little bit smaller than a pinhead, no joke. Jesus said kingdoms like that. It starts off so small, so minuscule. But when it's planted and it grows, it becomes the largest plant in the garden. The mustard seed that he's talking about, that particular species of plant, when it is mature, it can reach a height of 12 to 15 feet, starting from something smaller than the size of a pinhead all the way up to something that towers. And Jesus says the kingdom is like that. The expansion of the Christian faith is like that. It starts so small, but then it expands to something great. We see two things about the extent of the kingdom in this parable. We see its beginning in significance. It's beginning in significance. As I told you in verse 30 and 31, he talks about that mustard seed. So small, starting with such a teeny tiny beginning. He says the kingdom is like that. And think about how Christianity started. Jesus, He stepped down from the rims of glory. He left heaven and He came to Israel. It's called Palestine back then. It was a backwater of the Roman Empire. It was nowhere Roman Empire. Roman officials, Roman soldiers, they dreaded being sent to Palestine because it would end their career. That's how insignificant it was. While He was on earth, He had a three-year ministry. He never left that region. He never went to an earthly center of power. During his ministry, at best, he might have had several thousand followers. On the night of his death, on the night of his betrayal, rather his crucifixion, he had 11 hardcore followers, 11 leaders. And when he was betrayed, what did they do? They scattered. Yet three centuries later, Christianity had spread throughout all of the Roman Empire. It went through to every place in the known world. It had a small, insignificant beginning. And yet it spread, and it is continuing to spread today. Look, a uh, second point that I want you to see from this parable is not only its beginning insignificance, but its ending grander. Jesus says in verse 32 that that seed, it starts so small, yet when it matures... It becomes big. The kingdom, it expanded in Jesus' day to something large, and it is still expanding today. Do you realize that? We turn on the news, we see all the opposition to Christianity, and we forget what the Lord is still doing. Right now in this world, there are 2.1 billion people who claim Christ as Savior. Right now in China, every day, one day, 24 hours, one day, 10,000 people give their lives to Christ. In India, in one day, 5,000 people give their lives to Christ. Last year in the continent of Africa, 6 million people received Christ as Lord and as Savior. The kingdom is expanding. It starts small. It starts with the insignificant. But it has grown and it continues to grow to something mighty. But folks, if it's going to keep growing, if it's going to keep expanding... You and I, believers, have to step up to the plate and say, God has called me to serve. God has commanded me to serve. God would have me to serve and say, Lord, Father, what do you want me to do? And I'll do it. What are you doing for the Lord today? I ask that question again. Are you serving Him as you ought? Is there a ministry? Is there a mission that you are a part of? If not, you need to be. Every believer needs to serve 
is commanded to serve, is commanded to take part in that global effort of sharing the gospel. What we're fixing to do, we're going to have a time of, of decision and the altar is going to be open. And this is what I want to do. I just want to invite you to come up here and to ask God, Lord, what would you have me to do? Is there some area that you would have me to serve? Is there something that I need to be doing for your kingdom that I'm not? And he will tell you and he will show you. I invite you to come up here, pray about that. Ask what he would have you to do. And then whatever it might be, just say, Lord, I commit to that. You might be thinking right now, well, I, I want to serve. These things that you're saying, they're good, they're relevant, I understand that, but what can I do? You can start right here in this church. We just had the announcements. Did you see all of the volunteers that were needed for the different ministries of this church? If you want to serve, I, I promise you, we'll get you in somewhere. We will plug you into a ministry of this church. But just come, ask the Lord, what would you have me to do? How can I be a useful instrument unto you? And then I would also say this. You can't serve the kingdom until you know the king. Jesus is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. You can't serve him until you have bowed your knee, until you have received him as Lord and as Savior. Have you done that? Has there been a time and place in your life when you said yes to Christ? When you said no to sin? No to your old ways. When you repented, you turned from it and you put your faith in Christ and you said, you are the Lord. You are the Son of God. You are my Savior. If not, we want to give you an opportunity to do that as well. We're going to have a time of decision. If I can talk to you more about Christ, if I can pray for you in any way, come forward and let's talk. We're going to have a time of decision now.